Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah from Sourdough for Beginners. I am going to mix up just my regular recipe today, and I know lots of people like to see it happen and have the opportunity to ask some questions as they go, um, so I'm going to go through that today. Um, I'm going to use the slightly higher uh, beginner bread recipe hydration. Um, so in this video, I have posted the links to the beginner bread recipe. I'm going to increase the hydration on this one a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about how we can work sourdough into our real lives. Um, I got some awesome new bannetons. I'm going to show you those, um, and we're just going to go through it. So I'll stay on for, you know, 25 minutes or so and get through a recipe, and then uh, we'll just uh, take it from there. So hi, Jessica. Hi, Amber. Thanks for watching. So what I've got is two starters. Let me just actually grab this other one. Um, and what happened with my starters is that I used them this morning, but then I had to rush out before I could refeed them. So they're still ready to use. Like they're, they've peaked and they're past peak. And using a starter, past peak is going to give you a slightly stronger sour taste, which is um, what my family likes. Um, but I need 200 grams of starter to mix this double batch of the beginner higher hydration bread recipe. So I'm actually going to take some starter from both of my two jars. I do that a lot. Um, and on the last few lives that I've done, people have asked me why in the world I'm doing that. Um, so I just thought I'd clarify. So the beginner bread recipe is a low hydration recipe and low hydration makes bread um, easier to manage. Um, we at Sourdough for Beginners focus on what are the basic essentials? How can we make this easy for beginners so that they can start to, you know, get good loaves? Um, and then after that, they can start to add more advanced or optional processes. The essential processes are just to have an active starter, mix your dough, stretch and fold it three or four times, let it bulk proof on the counter in a clear straight sided container, pre-shape it, shape it, score it, bake it. Everything else is optional. So I'm going to increase the beginner bread recipe, which is normally 120 grams of starter to 200 grams of starter just to get my hydration up a little bit higher. A higher hydration, once you've mastered the processes, is going to end up giving you um, a, a thinner crust, that those nice bubbles, um, a, a lighter, airier bread on the inside. So I'm going to take about um, 100 grams from this starter and 100 grams from this starter, and it's going to leave me with very little, and then I'll refeed them after I've mixed. So my starter is nice and bubbly and active and sticky. It's past its peak right now, so let's get 100 out of here or whatever we can. So I just need to make sure that I leave enough in my jar to be able to refeed it so that... I don't run out. So this, almost at 100 grams. So I put 100 grams in and that's all that's left in my jar. But that's okay. I'm just going to give it a nice big feed after I've mixed up the dough. Um, and it'll, it'll beef itself right back up again. So one of the things I'm always trying to help people with is you know, don't be stressed. Like sourdough is super strong. Once you've got your starter activated and everything's good to go, um, there's a lot of things that are just per personal preference. And there's a lot of ways that you can just make sourdough fit into your life. So I took 100 grams out of this one and that's all it left me. But it's going to be okay. It's going to be lots. So we'll just refeed those after. So now the beginner bread recipe calls for 680 grams of water. I'm going to increase that to 700 grams. Um, I'm just using regular tap water, but I will be fair and say that I'm on a well. Um, so there is no chlorine in my water, but there is water softener salt in it. I'm finding that tap water just works fine for me. And usually what I say to people is if you would drink your tap water, it's probably fine. Um, to go into your sourdough. If you put your tap water through a Brita filter or whatever it may be, then maybe use that for your sourdough. But there's a lot of things out there that get presented as rules. And, oh, I thought I, I, thought I couldn't use metal with sourdough, or I thought I couldn't use tap water, or I thought I couldn't use bleached all-purpose flour. And there's really not no such thing as couldn't. There's certainly back practices. 
So, like I said, once you've mastered the essentials, which is what we're teaching in Sourdough for Beginners, then you can start to really up your game. You can start to, you know, add auto leasing, add cold proofing, add um, a second rise, add higher, um, higher quality and sturdier flowers. Okay, so what I've done right now is I've taken my starter, I've added my water, and I've whisked them together, and I've made like a nice hard to tip it for you guys but a nice foamy milky substance and now I'm just going to add my flowers and my salt to it but I wanted to show you guys these things so um, lots of people have bought my book it costs a few dollars um, so people have sent some stars it's really nice so I took the money that I earned and I bought these they're silicone so I have a round and a straight and I don't usually I don't often cold proof um, not because I don't think it's a good process. I think it's a great process and it can increase the flavor in your bread and it increases the strength and it can contribute to a better crumb. But for me, I'm always running behind and I usually need my bread. Um, so I, uh, so I often skip cold proofing for that, um, purpose, but check these out. They like flatten right down. And I have a tiny kitchen with an apartment size oven with no space for anything. So I liked that. Um, and apparently, I haven't tried it yet, but I'll do a video when I do. I can just put a little bit of flour in here. I don't need to line them or anything. And I'm excited because my bread's going to get these nice, like, lines on it that you see in all the Instagram videos. So they're pretty inexpensive. They just came yesterday. I gave them a good scrub to get that silicone smell out of them and I'm excited to use them. So today I'm going to blend regular all-purpose flour with felt flour. We like the flavor. Um, you can use any blend of flour that you like. You can use any flour that you like for making sourdough. Um, I often do just a, a, hundred, a thousand grams of all-purpose flour or mix others in. So Today, I'm getting low on spell. My bag's almost empty, and it's almost time to go grocery shopping. So I'm going to just start off by seeing how much spell they have here. What I need in this recipe is a total of 1,000 grams of flour. So let's just see how much is in this bag. So that came up at 193 grams. So now all I'm going to do is just top the rest of the recipe off with my... Um, regular all-purpose flour and get myself to a thousand grams. So I've been trying to do as many lives as I can so that people can actually like see the process happening and see how laid back it can really be. Um, the reality is that everyone has a life and sourdough is certainly a science. And if someone has time to really like do every single step that exists out there, then they should because it's fun. But if you're like me and sourdough is the only bread your family eats and you need it, um, then it's great to find ways that are just quick and easy and fast. I'm just going to add 20 grams of salt now. So this recipe is going to make two loaves of bread. You can just split it right in half if you don't need two loaves of bread. So you can do 100 grams of starter um, 350 grams of water, 500 grams of flour, and 10 grams of salt for the level two hydration. Or um, if you're going to do the beginner bread recipe, do 60 grams of starter, 340 grams of water, 500 grams of flour, and 20 grams of salt. All right, so 20 grams of salt. So now I've got my starter, my water, my flour, and my salt all in the mix here. So all I'm going to do is just sort of blend it on top to try and get those two different flours and salt to start mixing together. And then I'm going to stir the dough until most of the water has been absorbed. And then I'll switch over to my hand. So I'm not going to stay on very long today. So while I'm mixing, I'll just go over what the rest of the process is if you're just trying to follow the essentials for practice or, or for life um, and get yourself to the perfect loaf. So our recommendation is that you just follow the beginner bread recipe over and over again until you start getting perfect loaves, master the steps and the essential processes. And then once you're confident and in that time, you're going to gain so much experience and you're going to start to see how the dough really acts, then you can start adding more advanced processes. So right now I'm going to mix the dough. I'm going to just throw a towel over my bowl 
doesn't have to be damp or anything, just a regular tea towel. And I'm going to let it sit for 30 minutes. And then I'm going to stretch and fold it. And then I'm going to repeat that 30 minute rest and stretch and fold three more times. So as you gain experience, you'll start to be able to tell when your dough has built enough strength during the stretching and folding process. You'll be able to feel it, see it, everything. But as a beginner, when you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, the safest thing to do is just to do for three or four stretch and folds. Um, next, I'm going to split my dough into two equal size loaves and I'm going to put them in bulk proofing containers. I'll show you those in one second. So I just use like a standard container like this one here. It's eight cups, 1.8 liters, about, about two quarts. This is like rubber made brand, semi disposable. So I'll just put half, one loaf in each of those and then I'll take a marker and I'll mark the height of the dough and then I'll leave the dough sitting on the counter to bulk proof. So I'm not doing a second rise so I'm going to look for about a hundred percent rise and when you put your dough in the bulk proofing container and you mark it, mark it like where it actually is because it's not just going to rise up, it's going to rise side to side. Um, and then after it's done bulk proofing, I'm going to dump it out on the counter, no flour, no water. I'm going to pre-shape it. I'm going to let it rest for 30 minutes. And by the way, before I start pre-shaping, my Dutch oven's in the oven warming up, or if I'm going to use loaf pans, my oven's preheating. Um, then I will, um, then I will, um, do the final shape on my dough, score the dough, get it into the oven and bake it. Um, and I'm good to go. So like I said, you can add in all sorts of processes in the middle there, but that's sort of the easiest way. So what I find is that if I feed my starter the, before bed and I get up in the morning and I mix early, then I can run around and do my morning routine and just keep coming back to the dough and stretching and folding it. And then I can just let it bulk proof. Then I've got around five hours for me, but it will take between four to seven hours depending on your environment where I'm waiting for the dough to rise and then I can usually bake my bread before I start prepping supper. So this is mixed up good enough now. It's got a nice shaggy dough and you'll notice that the dough is like stuck. Um, so this is how dough starts, right? It's weak. It's not holding together. It's not becoming a structure. Right now it's a mix. When you do the 30 minute rest and the stretch and fold and the 30 minute rest and the stretch and fold, what you'll notice is each time as you do a stretch and fold, the dough will start to resist more and more and create elasticity. And eventually you'll be able to touch the dough without sticking to your hands like that. So that's a really good indicator that you've built enough strength. And then of course, there's all the other things that you'll probably see in the group set there, the window pane effect and um, you know, the different kinds of stretching and folding that you can do. Um, but like I said, my focus is how to make it easy for beginners. And I think that just doing the three or four stretch and folds is going to be the easiest way. So this is mixed. I'm going to let it sit now. It's 1048. So I'll, I'll stretch and fold this at about 20 after 11 and then 10 to 12. And then, um, 20 after 12 and then it'll be done. I'll split it into two loaves and stick it into my bulk proofing um, container. So now I'm going to reseed my two poor starters who I used and almost ran out of. Um, so I'm going to give them a nice bulky feed, but not too much, right? Because there's not a lot in the, in the jar. Um, but I will say with starters that they're pretty resilient. You can change the flour in them. You can change the ratio that you're feeding them. You can change, you know, how much you're feeding them. It doesn't have to be exactly the same all the time. As long as you're feeding them and they're getting used, they'll stay happy. Um, I just rescued these. These are deli containers. Just rescued them. Um, they've got a tight fitting lid and they work perfectly for me. What I've been doing lately is feeding my starters, letting them rise on the counter to double and then sticking them in the fridge at that doubled percentage. And I've been finding that they're staying doubled in the fridge for two, three days. So and I usually bake every two or three days. So I've actually just been pulling them out of the fridge and using them like that. 
But another way we recommend if you store in the fridge and bake once a week is to refeed it after you're done mixing, throw it in the fridge, let it rise or not, it's up to you. And then four to 12 hours before um, you bake, um, we suggest that you pull it out, discard it, feed it, um, and then use it in the morning to bake. Carrie, your wording is so helpful. I did my first loaf today and yesterday based purely off of look and feel. Let's see what the rest of this says. Um, your explanations tell me I did good. Yay, that's great, Carrie. Um, you might like the beginner bread recipe um, just to like see what the processes are. You might like the, the essentials book. Um, it just sort of breaks down like what are the essential processes and what are the advanced or optional processes when do they happen and how do they happen? I think that one of the biggest things that we see on the group is that people are really confused about how something happens, but also when it happens, right? Um, for example, people are always like, oh, well, if I don't have a banneton, can I let my bread rise in a bowl? And what we're saying is that bannetons are for cold proofing. You might not even need them at first. Um, but for sure, if you're truly talking about rice, we want we want to see that happening on the counter in a bulk proofing bowl. So let's see what we've got here. I'm really low in this starter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed this starter 50 grams each flour and water. I'm going to let it rise. I'm going to stir it down. And then I might feed it 50 grams each flour and water again to build it back up. Um, I could probably just go straight to 100 grams, 100 grams, but I just don't really want to overwhelm it. So let's just put 50 grams of flour in here. Have I done them dirty? I used them all up. And then I'm just going to put 50 grams of water in here. Good. And then I'm just going to stir this up, scrape down the sides. I don't really change my jar that often. It starts to get super crusty after a while, um, but I'm just going to scrape down my sides, seal my lid, and leave this on the counter beside my stove to rise today. And then I'll probably build it up bigger again by not discarding and refeeding it. But um, let's talk about starter thickness just for a minute while we're here. I see posts all the time in the big sourdough for beginners group that say, ah, my starter's really thick or ah, it's really watery. It doesn't matter. And in fact, if your starter's working properly, it should be both depending on where it is in its process. So right now, my starter's thick, like way thicker than pancake batter, right? Like if you look at it, but as it ferments, as it eats through the flour, what's fermentation? If you went all the way to the end of a fermentation process, you would have alcohol, right? So your starter is supposed to get, um, yes, of course, Beverly, I'll show it to you again. Um, so if, if, if your starter is fermenting well, it'll start thick when you feed it. And by the time it's peaked and eaten through its flour, it will be liquid. So it should be changing. And if you use your starter right at peak, then you'll get sort of just a nice taste. Um, if you wait past peak, you'll start to get more and more sour taste in your bread. And you can actually start to choose when you use your starter, depending on how much flavor you like. So Beverly just commented and asked if I could show my starter after I stir. So I wonder if I can show with this one. So this one isn't fed yet. This is the one I just used. And watch the difference. See how liquidy it is? See how I could almost pour it out? Whereas this one, which was just fed, is much thicker. You're welcome. My pleasure. All right, so let's just refeed this one. So this one is, has a little more than that one had. So I think with this one, I'm going to feed it 75 grams each of flour and water. So I hope it's coming across what I'm trying to do. I accidentally used way too much of my starter. I always like to have 300 grams on hand, um, 200 grams to mix a batch, and 100 grams to be able to dehydrate some. Um, I've got an Etsy listing with um, dehydrated starter flakes of mama. Um, and, you know, some people buy it if they want to skip the process of making their own starter. Um, so usually whenever I work with my starters, which is every two or three days, I'll use 200 grams in my um, recipe and I'll dehydrate 100 grams. 
And then I will just reseed um, 150 grams each of flour and water. So I do 75 in this guy of water and flour and 75 in that guy of water and flour. And that gives me 300, 300 grams of excess starter where I always keep my base. So Amber says, so yesterday I fed my starter. It had tripled in size. I had to go to work when it was at its peak. And by the time I got home from work, it had floated to about two times the original height. And that's when I use it for mine. I hope it's okay. As long as it's peaked, it's okay. Even if it's peaked and started to fall, you could still use it. All that's going to happen is the longer after peak you use it, the more fermented it is, the closer to the alcohol um, part of fermentation it is. And so the stronger the sour flavor is going to be in your loaf. I get lots of people on both sides of the coin saying, ew, my sourdough is way, way too sour. I don't like that taste. And I always say, okay, well, then make sure you time your starter so that you're, you're baking right at peak. And then other people say, um, other people say, uh, oh, I want that sour flavor. Um, and so I suggest that they wait until way past peak. Cameron just asked, how do you decide how much you need to feed your used starter? So I, it depends on what you need for what you're planning to do. So if you don't know what you're going to do at the next time you use your starter, just use, feed it a small amount, 50 grams each of flour and water to just to keep it alive. But if you're like me, then I know, right? I use 300 grams every time I use my starter, 200 grams in my recipe and 100 grams to dehydrate. So I always just feed my starters 300 grams total on a 50-50 basis. So 150 grams of flour and 150 grams of water. I keep it in two jars only because I don't want my jars to overflow. Um, so I keep it separate just to give them room to grow. But you could do it in a, in a huge jar. Um, so the real issue is the ratio. So you're working on a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio or a one to two to two ratio or a one to five to five ratio. The base of the ratio is always the starter. Um, so if you've got 50 grams of starter in your jar on a one to one to one, you would be feeding it 50 grams each of flour and water. If you were feeding it one to two to two and you had 50 grams in your jar, then you would feed it double that, 100 grams each of flour and water. Um, and um, it then what ends up happening is that your starter does different things based on the way you feed it. When you get like me and your experience, you start to realize, that, oh, hey, it's super laid back. So what's Amber saying here? Amber, I did your beginner recipe and I did half all purpose flour, half whole wheat flour, and then I divided it into two loaves. One loaf looks not right. And then the other loaf is baking now and it's looking more like it should. Um, so a couple things, 50-50 um, whole wheat and all purpose is a little high on the whole wheat side. Sometimes when you're going to use a high um, wheat ratio, like a sturdier flour, spelt, whole wheat, um, uh, rye, even oat, um, you might need to slightly increase your hydration because those um, flours are going to soak it up. But Amber, definitely um, look for the... Um, essential processes video on the YouTube channel or grab the essential processes ebook because um, it's pr probably whatever your issue is, is you were a little off in bulk proofing or you didn't pre-shape or whatever it is, but practice makes perfect. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to get it. Okay. So let's add 75 grams of water to this starter. Okay. Here we go. So I'll just show you. Someone asked if I could see inside my server while I'm stirring. So while I'm stirring this, it's very thick. And if I just left it sitting out on the counter for eight hours, it would eventually turn to liquid. So there's a couple things that are good to observe. Um, but that don't necessarily actually affect whether or not your starter is good or not. One is the thickness and consistency of your starter. Um, as long as you're not feeding your starter more water than flour. Um, Elaine, awesome. I'm really glad. Um, I hope you like it. I think I think I worked really hard on trying to figure out how do I make this easy. Um, but when you... Um, 
when you're looking at the consistency of your starter, I wouldn't worry about that. The other thing is that I just don't think the float test is um, reliable, so don't use it. The best indicator that your starter is good to use is that is when it's doubling consistently after every feed. So Colleen says, when I bulk ferment, it doesn't get domed, jiggly, and bubbly until it's almost tripled in size. Should I use it when it's doubled instead? So bulk proof percentage will be affected by a lot of things. The temperature in your home, what flour you used, how much, how high your hydration is. Um, and so if you're using the bulk proofing containers, Colleen, what I would suggest is, um, well, if you're not using the bulk proofing containers, I would definitely suggest you find the bulk proofing success video. Um, I'm going to post a bunch of videos in the comments that aren't already in the description of this video. Um, play with where you stop it. Stop it at 100%. Let it go to 150%. Maybe stop it at 75% until you get that perfect loaf. Um, but, and also too, if you're not, if you're allowing your dough to bulk proof in your big mixing bowl like this, sourdough doesn't rise the way yeast bread does, right? It doesn't get that like big puffy air filled rise that yeast bread does. It tends to more just like spread outwards and upwards. So it might actually be rising, but it doesn't look right. I don't know if that makes sense, but to answer your question, Colleen, I would say, do what's working and experiment with it until you find the perfect loaf. Elaine says, when I feed my starter, do I have to use equal amounts of starter flour and water? No, you don't have to use equal amounts of starter flour and water. I would say that the only thing that's important is that you're not having more water than flour because water can drown your starter. Um, but there's several different ratios you can use is you can use as long as your starter base is there, right, um, you want to try and keep the flour that you feed your starter at least equal to or more than the starter that you've got in there because it's hungry and it's going to eat the flour. And then you want to keep your water equal to or less than what your flour feed is. And I know that's starting to get a little bit complicated and confusing. The easiest thing to do as a beginner is to just keep it one to one to one. So 50 grams of starter, 50 grams of flour, 50 grams of water, or a quarter cup of starter, half a cup of flour, and a quarter cup of water to keep volumes equal. Um, that's the easiest thing to do. But like I said, if you're like me and you need more starter than, and say you only have 50 grams left in your jar, there's nothing wrong with feeding it 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of um, water. That's a one to two to two ratio, and it builds up your starter so that you have enough for what you're planning to do. Colleen, um, oh, good. I'm really glad, Colleen. Good, good. The beginner recipe is linked in the description of this video. This video will stay on the page, um, so you can always come back to it. I actually had just planned to come in and do a quick mix and show you guys my Bannetons, but um, this is going really great. I love all of your questions. I'm going to get ready to sign off soon, so if anyone's got any more questions, definitely ask them now, um, or just put them in the comments, and I just always go back and check these lives when I've got a minute here and there, and I'll come in and post links to whatever tutorial it is you might need and everything else. So here are my two starters. I keep a tightly sealed lid. I always like to talk about lids. There's no rule, okay? There just isn't a rule. Um, my starter goes fine without having a loose lid. It doesn't seem to need any yeast or, um, or anything from the air. I don't even know if needing yeast from the air is, is even true at all. Um, but what I find is that it's fine with the sealed lid, and so I'm just going to keep doing it that way. Um, not all starters with a loose or breathable lid mold and not all starters that did mold had a loose or breathable lid but we have 380,000 members in the sourdough for beginners group and the mods and I try and answer as many posts as we can and try to and have a whole set of tutorials and I'm not exaggerating when I say the vast majority of starters that molded had a looser breathable lid. So I think that using the sealed lid will 
prevent mold. And once the warmer, I haven't had any fruit flies because it's freezing here in Canada right now and we've got this much snow. But in the summer, I was starting to get fruit flies because fruit flies are attempt, uh, attracted to anything that ferments. So I think that um, keeping that seal sealed lid will, will prevent the fruit flies on the mold. So there we go. These guys are going to go sit. Uh, I mean, I'll adjust my... After a while, you get so much experience, you get so comfortable with sourdough and realize that it's so easy that you stop following all the processes that I'm constantly teaching. I think the basis for everything that I'm always teaching um, in, in the Sourdough for Beginners group and on this page and on YouTube is you're a total, total newbie. And how do we make this simple for you? And how do we help it so that you can work it into your life and make it work until you get those essential processes down and then you're gone. Like you're just going to figure it out yourself and do all kinds of experimenting. And the experimenting um, is part of the fun. And when we experiment, sometimes we fail. So Beverly says, thanks for the live today. You're so welcome. I love it here. I'm having so much fun with this. Um, thanks for watching. And I'll see you all again maybe in a couple of days. Bye for now.